Thank you, Monty. It's that time again when the holidays are followed by all kinds of sales in January. There's always plenty of customers looking for a bargain with the idea that the more they buy, the more they save. It seems there's a lot of farmers with a similar view about nitrogen management. They see nitrogen fertilizers as a cheap form of insurance against yield loss. That insurance philosophy got its start back in the mid-1970s with the so-called proven yield method. In this method, a realistic corn yield goal is multiplied times 1.2, and the product is then corrected if necessary to account for nitrogen credits from a previous legume or manuring. Over the past five decades, the proven yield method has been used more widely than any other method of making end recommendations for corn. And nowhere has it been more popular than in Illinois, where it originated from a series of 34 nitrogen response studies conducted at university experiment fields in the late 60s and early 70s. Every one of these studies used a static plot design, which simply means that individual plots receive the same fertilizer treatment year after year. The effect of the static plot design is to depress the zero end rate or the check plot yield, which you can clearly see from these response curves. And that check plot problem creates a recommendation that doesn't represent farmer fields because the farmer never has an area in the field that he leaves unfertilized year after year. What the check plot design does do is to make the fertilizer look better and the soil look worse than it actually is as a source of nitrogen. That check plot design, or that static plot design, leads to the first of two key assumptions behind the proven yield method. And this one says that at harvest, the crop has taken up two thirds of its nitrogen from the fertilizer and only one third from the soil. The best way to check that assumption is using isotopically labeled N15 fertilizer that's applied in the field and then at harvest the plant material is analyzed to determine the uptake of labeled fertilizer in and unlabeled soil in. That's exactly what was done to collect the data shown in this slide. It comes from static plot studies in western Illinois at Monmouth on a series of continuous corn plots. The study involved the use of labeled fertilizer in at four different rates ranging from 60 to 240 pounds per acre. As you'd expect, the higher the fertilizer rate the greater was the uptake in the crop. But the key point is that at harvest, with every one of those four rates, 
the uptake of soil in had exceeded the uptake of fertilizer. And that was true even at the highest rate, 240, where the amount of fertilizer applied was more than what the crop took up total. The soil still outcompeted the fertilizer. The idea that the fertilizer is the main source of N leads us to a second key assumption, which says that higher yields need more fertilizer in. Do they? Let's take a look at it using on-farm response data coming from 47 studies in Illinois. And in this figure, we're plotting economically optimum yield from those studies versus economically optimum end rate. If this assumption is correct, we'd expect to see a positive sloping trend line between the two parameters going up as we go to the right. We don't see it. Instead, we see a scattering of data points. And down here in the lower right, we notice the correlation coefficient is 0.25, and that was not statistically significant. Now, why would there be no relationship between these two parameters? Maybe it's because there's another source of nitrogen the crop uses besides the fertilizer, like the soil. And maybe it is that different soils differ in how much nitrogen they supply. So that the sites that gave the data points on the right side of the figure didn't supply very much nitrogen and needed a lot more fertilizer to optimize the yield. Whereas the ones on the left side, and even here along the y-axis, supplied a lot more nitrogen and needed a much lower end rate or even none at all. Now, if these two assumptions for the proof of yield method are not valid, you probably can't expect too much in the way of accurate fertilizer recommendations by this method. And that's confirmed by the next slide which shows us a summary of the accuracy of the proven yield re recommendation relative to the actual optimum end rate determined from yield response data. And this is for 102 on-farm studies. The figure is set up so that the errors in the proven yield recommendation are categorized into seven groups that go between these ranges so that we're on and on the left side, the recommendation by the proven yield method was more than 50 pounds per acre too low. To over on the far right, it was more than 150 pounds per acre too high. Now, the best place to be in this set of data is in the green bar. I like to call that group the fortunate few. They got the correct end rate to within 20 pounds per acre but they only accounted for about 20% of the sites, about 20 sites. The remaining 80% were left with a, a rate that was either too low with the two blue bars here, or more likely too high with the four red bars. The tendency toward over fertilization, which goes right back to the static plot design is confirmed by the numbers in the box. It summarizes the average numbers for both optimum end rate and proven yield recommendation. And we find out that the proven yield recommendation was almost 60 pounds per acre higher than it should have been. Now at this point, you might be thinking, the proven yield method is a disaster. 
The assumptions are a joke and so are the recommendations. But I would point out that this method has done precisely what it was designed to do. Cell fertilizer. Let's revisit the assumptions, but let me put them under a different heading. Fertilizer myths. First one says that the nutrient uptake comes mainly from the fertilizer. The second one, that the soil is a minor source. And the third, that good soils need more fertilizer than poor soils because they have a higher yield potential. And in contrast to those three, I give you three more that I label fertilizer facts. And they're the reverse. That the nutrient uptake is mainly from the soil, that fertilizers are supplemental, and that poor soils are the ones that need more fertilizer, good soils need less. Now, you don't have to take my word for this. We have all the proof we need on the cover of an Illinois Experiment Station Bulletin published in 1945. <coughs> the bulletin was reporting long-term yield trends as related to fertility treatment for a network of outlying Illinois experiment fields. On the cover, it contrasts a poor soil from southern Illinois with a good soil from northern Illinois. In both cases, the colored panels are showing yield trends for different treatments over time that range from 1910 to 1945. And the y-axis in each case is the percent of maximum yield for a mixed crop rotation that included corn, a small grain, and a forage legume. Now notice, if you will, that the lower panel for the good soil is dominated by brown. And as we define the colors on the right side, that brown represents the check plot treatment, where not only was there no input of fertilizer, they removed all the above ground biomass. And still, that good soil pretty much held its own over those years. Not so with the poor soil. The poor soil dived down quickly when it was losing those inputs, and then it just bounced along the bottom. The next color coming up is light blue, which means the return of above ground residues. Didn't do much to the poor soil, but it did help the good soil. And that's, of course, because a good soil grows better residues than a poor soil. They have more nutrients, and they give more back. Then we come to the orange zone. The biggest effect on the poor soil came from residues plus limestone. Did hardly anything on the good soil. And then we come to the yellow zone. That was rock phosphate plus limestone plus residues. Another nice increase for the poor soil, virtually nothing for the good. And finally, at the top, we have the light gray shaded area that adds potash to rock phosphate and limestone and residues. A nice increase for the poor soil. Hardly anything for the good. So it's very clear from this cover that it's the poor soil that needs help. It needs fertilizer. It needs limestone. The good soil needs much, much less. Now, if we're going to use this concept to put in place a soil-based N management system instead of the yield-based proven yield method, we need some way to distinguish and predict what's a poor soil from what's a good soil. Since 2001, 
One option for doing that has been the Illinois Soil End Test, or ISNT. It's a simple diffusion method that uses mason jars on a pancake griddle. The soil is treated with sodium hydroxide to liberate a fraction best described as alkali labile organic N. And that fraction estimates how much N the soil can supply through mineralization. When this test was first developed and published in 2001, we evaluated it using soil samples coming from 25 on-farm and response trials. And of those 25 trials, there had been 12 that showed no significant response to end fertilization. Those are the 12 in this figure on the right-hand side right along the baseline. They're non-responsive and they tested higher than the remaining 13 that did show a response. And we found we could separate the two groups with, if we assumed a critical, critical test range of between 225 and 235 parts per million. So that finding generated a good deal of optimism and led to a lot more work. But we need to realize just predicting what's a non-responsive soil is not quite enough. We need quantitative rate recommendations, and we really ought to do them site specifically. Well, it didn't take too long for several in the private sector to catch on to the possibilities of doing variable rate in with the ISNT. Here's a data set coming from Tim Smith at CropSmith, dates back to 2007, when he grid sampled a 68-acre field for Bex hybrids. So Tim's sampling points are shown with the green circles, and beside them are two values. The upper one indicates the ISNT for the surface foot, and the second one is the second foot. Based on those test values, and I suspect as well on soil type, Tim zoned the field, so the, he, he created this dark green area that he identified as the low testing part of the field, and for that he gave it an end rate of 180. This light area over here on the right side, that was the high testing area, and he backed off on the end rate to 115. And then that same year, Bex came in and they did replicated end response trials in both of those areas. That's the rectangular blue shaded areas here. And they found out when they harvested their, their corn that the optimum end had come with 175 pounds in the low testing area and with 125 in the high. Pretty darn close to what Tim had recommended. So it gives some encouraging evidence that site-specific management can be done with a soil-based approach. So to sum things up, number one, as we've seen, it's not the yield goal that determines the end need for corn, it's the soil. And we've seen that poor soils are the ones that need more fertilizer in, while good soils need less. And thirdly, as shown by the previous slide, fertilizer, fertilizer end rates should be site specific. But unfortunately, they usually aren't. And that's partly due to that insurance philosophy of end management that promotes higher end rates. Those high end rates can cause a long-term problem for the soil itself. And that's a subject we'll talk about tomorrow. Thank you.